Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Town of Gibson's Committee of the Whole Meeting for January 18, 22, acknowledging that we're meeting electronically on the traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. Uh, we have an agenda. Um, those of you who have access to it, it's uh, on, our, on our website and uh, help yourselves. Um, I'm, we have um, several items to go through this afternoon, uh, two delegations followed by uh, administrative work and uh, an in-camera meeting at the end of this agenda. So first of all, I'll call for approval of the agenda. Councillor Kroll, Councillor Ladwig, thank you. All in favor? Thank you very much. And I believe that Councillor Lumley is not available for us today, uh, so that uh, we'll uh, proceed on without him. Um, we have two delegations uh, this afternoon, as I mentioned. The first one is Paul Fripp of BDO Canada, talking about the 2021 audit planning report. And uh, invite Paul to come forward. Um, Rebecca, I'll leave it to you. He should be joining you now. Okay. I see him, Paul, you're muted still. Well, lots of people. There we are, Paul. Welcome. Good. Nice, Good nice to see you again. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Paul. Okay, wonderful. I, uh, I'm going to share my screen so that uh, everybody has the benefit of following along. Um, we uh, we do have, I know the agenda is pretty full and, and we have a limited amount of time to go through the materials here. So I'm going to focus at a relatively high level um, and leave some time for some questions um, if there's anything that's come up in your review of the document. Um, so we're going to start in, uh, in the audit planning letter uh, with our audit timeline. So um, we typically conduct our planning and in what's called an interim audit period uh, that took place December 13th to 15th. And that culminates uh, with, uh, with this letter here where we, you know, we identify uh, matters of importance for our audit and we bring forward those matters for discussion. So that has completed, and uh, uh, you know, today we're here talking about the audit planning report. Um, we do have the final audit field work scheduled for late March, uh, with um, sort of clearance and and a final presentation to mayor and council in late April. So planning along the typical timeline. Well, in advance of the May 15th deadline filing uh, of uh, municipal financial statements with the province. All right. So, um, your uh, core engagement team remains unchanged. Uh, myself, Paul Fripp, is your lead engagement partner. Contact phone number and email is here for your reference, as well as other key members of the team. Darren Taylor, who's the uh, tax partner uh, who assists predominantly with indirect taxes, um, uh, as well as uh, Narendra, uh, who is the audit engagement manager. Um, our responsibility in relation to the financial statements is outlined in the engagement letter, but um, for your benefit, uh, we list them here. Um, so we work with management towards timely issuance of the financial statements, as well as provide a report of our audit to mayor and council with significant findings, as, as well as constructive management letter points. And that's where we identify efficiencies or best practices that we would would uh, like to highlight uh, to management's attention. We're uh, always available year round to the, to the town and management uh, if any questions come up or as needs arise as well. When we conduct our audit, we are responsible for providing an opinion on the audited financial statements. And that's whether um, those financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. Now, in discharging that obligation, we need to consider whether there's potential errors in the financial statement that are caused by um, just, you know, data entry error, tra transposition errors. There's many different kinds of errors that can arise, but also would include fraud. And so we're required to consider the possibility for fraud arising within the town. Um, and we design tests and procedures around where we perceive um, the potential for fraud to arise. 
And we do that by, uh, you know, our understanding of the town, its operations, its control environment, um, and the work that we conduct with other local governments across BC and Canada. Uh, and we, we sort of carry out those procedures. We report back to council on, on the results of those procedures in our audit results letter. But we do ask that um, management as well as mayor and council um, uh, provide to us any information with regards to actual suspected or alleged frauds that have occurred at the town in the past year or after year end um, so that we can design audit procedures around those uh, potential risk areas and determine if there's any issues to report. At present, we're not aware of any circumstances that we'd bring to your attention. And if anyone on uh, council is aware of any circumstances that we should be aware of. Our contact information is provided in the letter. You feel free to reach out to us. Um, our reporting on uh, the our work approach has changed slightly this year. We've uh, distinguished between significant risks and other audit areas. Significant risks are those risks by virtue of their nature, have a higher chance of creating a material misstatement. Um, and so we have elevated those uh, so that they are clear and transparent to mayor and council. Um, the, uh, the only significant risk that we've determined for the town is the potential for management override of internal controls. That does not mean that we believe that management is actively overriding controls. It just means that management by virtue of their position could override internal controls. This is a mandatory consideration under Canadian auditing standards. So this is not unique to the town of Gibsons. It's applied to all local governments across Canada. Um, uh, and it is part of those fraud procedures that I uh, alluded to earlier that we are required to design and uh, 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 in an attempt to uh, uh, determine whether fraud has occurred within the entity. We don't just focus on one area of the financial statements. We, uh, I'm sure if you asked um, your team, your finance team at the town, they tell you that we go through a lot of the records um, at the town uh, during our audit. And so these are some of the other areas that we uh, conduct audit procedures around. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some of the bigger areas. Mm -hmm. And we elevate these areas because of their specific nature and financial statements. And depending on what we identify in these areas could give rise to a significant risk of material misstatement, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So those are staff salaries, just being, you know, in any local government, staff compensation wages um, forms a very significant part of the annual expenditures. And so we are predominantly looking at internal controls around the payroll processes, as well as at year end, we're looking at the uh, variance to budget and prior year, as well as other analytic procedures to see if there's any unusual results there. Developer contributions, these present very specific risks in that they can be um, contributions of assets or they're contractually driven. And so they can be more complex than, and, and they occur less frequently than other types of transactions. So when these occur, um, we want to make sure that we're reviewing the source documents that give rise to these transactions and that they're appropriately recorded in the financial statements. The next item, operational impacts of COVID-19. We are not out of the woods yet with Omicron, uh, um, you know, running rampant uh, throughout BC at the moment. Uh, and so this continues to be a potential area where it could impact different sources of revenue, different levels of expenses, but also note disclosure. And so while you know, most uh, organizations, the town included, have good processes to manage um, you know, increased absences or remote work arrangements, um, uh, we still have this as a potential consideration to sort of keep in the back of our minds as we're conducting our audit. 
And last but not least, uh, revenue recognition is always a complex area of accounting standards. This is not considered a significant risk of material misstatement for the town because it has a fairly standard routine um, set of revenue uh, streams, so taxation and government grants and fee for service, and whatnot. Um, and so we're relatively comfortable in this area, but we're always looking at these revenue streams to make sure that if there's anything new, we're looking at the underlying arrangements, agreements and contracts. Um, if there's new programs or new revenue streams, we're looking at those to make sure that they're being accounted for in accordance with the correct standard um, because government funding, taxation, and then fee-for-service all fall in a, under a different standard. All right, and finally, last but not least, the measure against which we evaluate an audit and provide our audit opinion is a concept known as materiality. And so this helps us determine the level of sampling um, and, and evaluating uh, errors and whether, um, you know, uh, an error, uh, whether it's magnitude or pervasiveness in a set of financial statements could cause us to provide an adverse or qualified audit opinion. That level has been set consistently with past years, which is 3% of budgeted revenues. And that works out to be 325,000 for the 2021 audit. Um, if there's any adjustment uh, between now and year-end results that would cause us to reevaluate materiality, we would communicate that in our final audit results letter. Okay, so that runs us through all the important points of um, uh, our planning letter. Uh, the other material that's in there is for your reference and, and to read at your leisure, but I'm happy to take any questions on, on any content of the letter at this time, if there are any. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, uh, I'll go to Council first. Council, does Council have any questions? Council Dean Drive? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. It's just the concept of materiality. And can you go a second round, <laughs> elaborate a little bit more? Because I couldn't really grasp. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I don't, let me see if I can work at it a different way. Um, as a profession, we'd be unable to provide an absolute level of assurance over a financial statement, which means that we can't guarantee that a set of financial statements are free from error. Mm -hmm. um, to do so would require to have a team on site year round and looking at every single transaction. Mm -hmm. However, what the concept of materiality uh, is trying to communicate is that this concept of fair presentation in that an error that exists of a certain magnitude or of a certain nature, if it were to exist, does not impair the usability of those financial statements. So, you know, I, I think we, we could probably all agree if that there was a $100 error in the statements that it would likely um, it would not likely render the statements unusable. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we went to the textbook definition of materiality, uh, it says that uh, uh, something would, a set of financial statements would be considered to be materially misstated if those misstatements, so errors or, or incorrect values, um, could reasonably ex be expected to influence a user's decision taken on the basis of those financial statements. So we, we have assessed materiality on two bases. One is a quantitative basis, which we communicate to you, which is that 3% of budgeted revenues. The concept being that your financial statements could, could be plus or minus 3% of the results that you see there. Um, or plus or minus 325,000. Um, we also evaluate it on the basis of uh, qualitative considerations in that if we found fraud, even regardless of its magnitude, we would be coming back to council and having a discussion on whether that impacted the uh, financial statements and, and uh, also impacts our audit opinion on those financial statements. Now, some frauds 
may determine that it, it is not materially misstated, but it still requires that discussion to be had. Um, so, um, and I, I think I'll end with, that doesn't mean that we let errors sit in the financial statements. When we detect errors, we encourage management to correct those errors and the town's finance uh, staff and management have always been very receptive to correcting uh, errors identified through the audit process. Um, so it doesn't mean that you'll have $325,000 worth of errors sitting there when we come to the audit results period. But it is the threshold by which we, we would say if it's above that level, we would be providing a different opinion. It would not be an unqualified clean audit opinion. It would be a reserved audit opinion, whether that's a, you know, a, a scope, scope limitation or a denial of opinion or, or a gap departure. It sort of depends on the nature of the air. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ladwick. Uh, yeah, thanks, Paul. I I'm sure I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Has BDO ever considered developing some kind of a performance ranking system where you like use a set of criteria to look at how a municipality is performing relative to other municipalities and then kind of give them a gold star or a thumbs up? Or, you know, like it would just be nice to know how we're doing relative relative to other municipalities. And I have I think I'm, I'm sure I'm biased. But I think we've got a fantastic director of finance. So I, I think we're probably getting a gold star, but, um, but I know that the, the formalities of an audit don't, don't reflect that in a sense. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, where this idea of benchmarking is something that as data becomes more um, easily accessible uh, is, is something that we can start looking towards a couple of things that make this rather challenging is, you know, different um, sets of legislation, you know, allowing us to effectively use that, use that data for the benefit of uh, existing clients and, and for audit purposes um, uh, as well. Um, not all local governments necessarily would record um, transactions in the same way. There are different choices and financial statements that you can make. So while there, you know, would be measures that broadly that you could benchmark against, it might not always be an apples to apples comparison. Right. As far as quality of management um, and and sort of effectiveness of a finance department, we certainly get certain insights into that, which you know, you know, maybe comes across. Uh, inadvertently through a couple different ways, looking at the level of errors that we're identifying, you know, is it three or is it 20 um, uh, audit adjustments or audit differences that we're identifying, um, you know, in the letter that we provide to management, are they best practice recommendations or are they true deficiency or gaps in internal controls? These would be different things that that council can read between the lines, if you will, but we couldn't draw direct comparisons to say, um, it, you know, specifically naming uh, other local governments, but we do craft those comments based on our, our knowledge of what other governments are doing. So I think that's how you can maybe use some of the reporting that we provide to, to get a gauge on, on how well your, your finance team is doing. And, and I will say, um, I think your finance team does a fantastic job. Hi. Happy to happy to uh, volunteer that. Yeah, thank you very much. Councillor uh, Kroll. Thank you, Mayor Beamish. Um, and, th and thank you for your presentation, Paul. Um, and just sort of further to Councillor Ludwig's comment, I would, as I would assume your auditor's report um, would be included in any finance thing outside the community we did, and it would reflect in our our um, <clears throat> credit rating, would it not? Um, uh, I would assume so. That That's maybe a comment um, that Lorraine can answer directly um, when, you know, the town goes out to uh, source debt through MFA. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming that as a financer, they would require the audited financial statements as, as a means to evaluate uh, the town and, and uh, 
uh, in, in advance of dispersing those loan proceeds. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to the Director of Finance. Uh, Director, do you have any kind of comments or insights uh, uh, for us in this process as we go forward? In general, um, Paul has outlined, uh, thank you, Paul, for your presentation. Uh, he's outlined the process so far, like we've had an interim. Uh, and again, we're all now virtual. So the interim is virtual and our, our final audit will be virtual as well. We're already working on our year end transactions to get things ready for the audit team that's going to come in March. And um, no, we're always really pleased to be working with BDO. We have a good relationship and really, really uh, helpful when they do point out suggestions for us to make adjustments or recommendations or just observations. It's been really, it's a really good uh, relationship that we have. Thank you. And Paul, part of our, our process here in terms of um, uh, asset management uh, does get reported on in our financial reports, our assets. How, is there any measure anywhere that anybody's using relative to natural assets, how natural assets are being handled and how they are being accounted for? Yeah, so at present, natural assets are not recorded in financial statements unless there are, are costs undertaken by the local government that um, where the future benefit is, is tangible. And then it sort of falls under the tangible capital assets. You can think of situations like construction uh, of dikes, for instance, where if you had, say, a natural dike and, and you filled it in or built it up to a 200-year standard, then those costs incurred would be capitalized. But as far as recognizing the value that our natural landscapes provide to our communities, these are not recorded in financial statements. There is certainly a lot of discussion and debate around this, um, but uh, where the profession is at the moment is that, you know, the, the, the cost to accumulate that information and integrate that into financial reporting is likely uh, a burden greater than, uh, you know, a lot of local governments would want to incur. So that's kind of just the general landscape. It's an evolving discussion. There's certainly a lot of really interesting uh, pieces out there. I know that uh, Town of Gibsons, as well as District of West Van, have been very strong proponents uh, for this uh, agenda item, and, and it continues to be a topic that's discussed uh, both at the local and, and national levels. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that, as you say, evolves in, in the future. Oh. Well, I see no other hands up, Paul. I, I thank you very much again for your presentation and uh, look forward to May when we'll probably receive a presentation from you of the, the uh, audit report. So thank you very much for that and for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure to be here and we'll see you all at the audit results uh, thank presentation. You. Thank you. Bye. Okay, uh, our next item on our agenda is another delegation 3.2. And we have uh, Emily G, TJ Sheenan, and Dana Capel for the Coast Recovery Community. I invite them to come forward. Okay, we also have our Director of Planning with us uh, for this discussion. Hey, I see you all, you're all muted still. Perfect. Oh, there, okay, come in Dana, thank you. TJ and Emily, welcome, everybody. So, uh, yeah, you're going to talk about the uh, regarding the 624 Farnham Road Recovery House, and I'll let you, whoever of your trio is going to lead the conversation, please uh, proceed. Good. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Beamish and Town Council. We really do appreciate the opportunity to present to you all. My name is Dana Capel, and I'm um, I'm passionate about building strong community on the Sunshine Coast. It's always been my mission. Mm -hmm. I've worked with restorative justice for eight years as a liaison between the RCMP and the young offenders and the community to create case resolution. Uh, currently, I'm with the District of Seashelt Advisory Planning Committee and uh, my role at CRC is as the communications director. So the coast has changed and one cannot miss the signs of addiction. 
uh, just a segue here, our family vision has always been to create a foundation focusing on helping individuals and families recover from addiction. Um, in our family, we joke that um, we have a master's in mental health and addiction. <laughs> uh, when this opportunity on Farnham arose, it seemed like the perfect fit in terms of location, neighborhood, and community engagement. Just this morning, um, we met with Vancouver Coastal Health uh, for the second time uh, with their team, and we met to plan ways that we can align with them um, with referral services and outpatient needs. And this is, you know, this is them and us. They approached us on this. So to pivot why we're here, we're here because we're really eager to work under the leadership with staff and council to come up with a win-win for everyone. Um, and basically to create a solution for those people who are still suffering. Now, my understanding is that the OCP is a living document and it allows for change and growth that contributes to the social well being of the coast, that it's not static and carved in stone. So I just want to leave with that. And um, now I'll pass it on to Emily. Thanks, Dana. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for letting us present today. My name is Emily and I'm the executive director of CRC. Um, a little bit of my background. Uh, I went to uh, Discovery Community College in Surrey for uh, a police foundations program in 2017 and 2018. After I graduated there, I started working at ECOM, which is the 911 center for British Columbia, where I was a call taker for about three years answering 911 calls for Whistler, Squamish, Pemberton, the island, everything over from West Vancouver, sorry, over to Abbotsford and the Sunshine Coast. Um, me and my family have been affected by addiction. My sister was a heroin addict for about 16 years. She was in and out of recovery, in and out of jail. Me and my mom detoxed her more times than I can count. Um, I single-handedly have seen how hard addiction can hit and how ruthless it can be. Um, her addiction ran our family for almost those six, those full 16 years. And so because of this, I know what it takes for successful recovery. Um, I'm really passionate about recovery and helping others. And me and TJ and Dana have given so much to this life changing project. Understanding we are all learning together when we brought this project into light in September, we weren't told about needing to bring the facility up to the current building code. Since then, we've happily invested a lot of time and our own financial saving, savings into this facility. And if bringing the facility up to the code is the thing that shuts this project down, this would be a huge disservice, disservice to our community. And with that, we're really hoping that with the leaders of our community, you guys can walk beside us and help figure out a solution in a timely manner because from the recent coroner reports, there's around six people a day in BC dying from overdose. So we're just really passionate about this and I'm really grateful to be um, presenting to you guys and I'm really grateful to be a part of CRC. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to TJ. Thanks Emily. Uh, good afternoon everybody. Thanks for being here, really appreciate it. Um, just to follow up with that, you know, speaking of Vancouver Coastal Health, before all the new um, numbers came out, the Sunshine Coast is second to the downtown east side per capita for overdoses. Um, Powell River has caught up a little bit, so they are, they are um, the leading. Anyways, I'm TJ. I grew up on the Sunshine Coast. I was born here, um, part of this community. I left when I was 15, went to Alberta to move and work on the oil rigs. Um, I've been personally touched by addiction. I've had my own battles with addiction. I've since found recovery and, and I'm living the life that I never thought possible. I moved back to the Sunshine Coast in 2019 and I was horrified. Um, you know, growing up here, a lot of my friends from high school are now in active addiction. Um, I've lost about 30 friends in the last 10 years to overdose. Um, so it's, it's pretty touching to me. Uh, I had a business here 
And I had lost four friends in one week to overdose. And I knew that I needed to do something. I was able to pivot and sell my business in COVID, which I'm super grateful for. And I've used all the finances from that to make this project come to light. Uh, when we first started, you know, we looked around for a house, a residential house to, to operate this facility in. And there's nothing. As, as you guys know, there's a housing shortage on the Sunshine Coast. And we just couldn't find anywhere, any places that would even call us back. They would have, you know, a 25, 30 person wait list. And as soon as we would mention addiction, um, you know, they would just, they didn't want to even have anything to do with us. So that being said, we talked to our landlord and they were very accommodating for us to use the space that um, I had my business in. I was in a commercial lease here and they were, they were excited about what we could do. And so with that, we really, I mean, the facility for us is perfect. Um, we did a few small renovations just to accommodate the four beds and how that would look. Um, we also danced around the idea of going for non-for-profit and how the structure of this company was going to work. And, you know, it was just too much to try to do all the fundraising that wasn't guaranteed. You know, the government pays $45 a day for recovery right now. And, at four beds at $45 a day, you're supposed to house, clothes, feed, counsel, and entertain these people. It wouldn't even cover a quarter of my rent. Um, so we did uh, some really extensive research and what we came up with was a benefit corporation, which is a new corporation that has come out in June, 2020. Uh, perfect example is Persephone's is now a B Corp. They started off as a benefit corporation. So we're really hoping for a B Corp status after two years. There's only about 2,500 benefit corporations in Canada. So we are certified and registered. We have made that leap and, and we are approved at that. Um, that being said, you know, our whole model is impact over income. So we're not here to, to make money. We're here to invest in our community. With that being said, forwarding this project uh, moving forward, we're really hoping to uh, open up a sister house. So this one is strictly for men. And then we're really hoping to do one that are for women. And at that point, being successful, then we can start to look at the government funded beds. Um, a big part of our whole solution, because we've all been personally touched um, by addiction, is we really want to help the people that want help. You know, coming into recovery, you have to want it or you're not going to be successful. So that's one of the things that, um, you know, really challenges us to become a benefit corporation. And it allows us to give um, the best quality to our clients. So, you know, some of these larger facilities that have 10, 20, 30 beds, they cluster into smaller groups anyway. So having four beds... Um, really allows intimate relationships and, and the men to be vulnerable. Men are the ones who are overdosing at this high rate. Um, and some of the things that we're going to include, you know, private rooms, yoga, educational workshops, guest speakers. Um, we include a year of aftercare. So basically, once the people come into the treatment for 30, 60, 90 days, um, after they graduate from our program, we have a year aftercare. I'm a certified recovery coach, interventionist, and anger management therapist. So we work with them once a week. We meet with them after about a month. If they feel confident enough, then we meet once a month for 12 months. And after they get a year of uh, clean sobriety, they get a plaque on the wall and they are allowed to come back and um, speak to the, the newcomers and the new group. One of the other reasons is there's nothing like this on the Sunshine Coast. So we're really bridging the gap. A lot of people now, if they want to go to private treatment, they're having to go to Powell River, they're having to go to Vancouver, they're having to go to the island. The problem with that is when they come back to their community, they don't have that support network. So they don't have, you know, they, they go back to their old toxic friends, their job and their families, which can for them be a lot of times triggers and they don't have the support network. So what we're really trying to encourage is to have that support network, even if they have graduated from our program and they're out at work having a bad day or they have something with their, their family, they can come back and come sit in on meetings with the guys. They can come to the gym with the guys. They can come on nature hikes. So we really want to encourage that community building because it's so important. And, and when these guys relapse after being clean for, for the 30, 60, 90 days, um, they're, they're dying because they have that tolerance. They don't have that tolerance anymore. And, and the street drugs out there are so strong um, that they don't have that second chance. So, you know, we're, we've really worked with planning and, and you know, Leslie Ann and Kirsten have been more than accommodating and great. And, and we're really trying to come up with a solution. Um, we're just kind of stuck and we don't know what to do. Our, our, you know, the, the thing that seems kind of reasonable to me, and I don't know enough about it, is to grant us a temporary use permit, um, site specific just for this to get us up and running. Because right now, you know, we've invested so much of our own money into this. And we're right at the breaking point where this project is either going to fold and we're going to have to walk away, or, you know, we can really start making a difference in our community. 
Um, so to, you know, the, I don't own this building. It's leased. The landlords have been more than accommodating for the situation, but to do structural upgrades to a building that is quite old um, would, would literally fold this project. I really wish that, you know, anyone is welcome to come and, and walk through the building and have a look to see what we've created. You know, we, to, to have up to 10 support staff who will be working here and to try to have, you know, 10 vehicles parking in a residential area, it, ju it just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, we have a huge parking lot here. We're two, uh, two houses down or two buildings down from Vancouver Coastal Health. So we're so close to them. Um, we have wheelchair accessible so that if any family members is in a wheelchair, they can come. If there's an ambulance that needs to come, the gurney can get wheeled right up to the door. There's easy egress. Also for family members coming to visit out of town, there's a hotel that is right across the street, you know, because uh, part of our program is we encourage family to come in pre treatment we sit down with the family develop a plan explain how it's going to work and then post treatment so once they graduate the family actually comes back in and we sit down and say here's some triggers they need you more than ever this is a support network so we're really involved with the family um, so I guess my my final ask is just you know we're looking for leadership and, and for advice and to make this happen by any means. You know, we're, we're resilient and, and have pivoted uh, quite a few times to try to juggle everything. And we're, we're really just asking for help, how we can get this up and running and, and be of a service to our community. Because, you know, as you know, that people are literally dying and, you know, these are our family members. These are our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, um, people that we know in the community. We walk by them and see them and, and, and the next week they're not there. So, you know, we're really passionate about getting this going and um, we're really hoping that we can work together and, and achieve this common goal. So thank you very much for taking the time for a presentation. Mayor Bennett, you're muted. Did you get all that? <laughs> no, okay, okay. Uh, I wanted to say thank you again very much for your presentation, Dana, TJ, and Emily. Your passion comes through in your in your comments, and uh, and your and your your. It's evident that you very strongly um, support our community in this way. I and I understand the need for what you're doing. Um, uh, I won't go into any personal issues, but I understand that. So um, I will though. Um, before, I mean, give the director of planning a chance to speak to council. Uh, but before we do that, does council have any questions of clarification that I'd like to ask now? Uh, Councillor Kroll? Um, not so much. Thank you, Mary Beamish. And uh, thank you for the presentation, TJ and Dana and Emily. Um, and just for council's background, um, TJ and Dana may, and Emily made this um, outlined their project to the CAP committee. Um, I think it was probably last August. So this, this is a project that has been in the works, um, critical to the coast. In one of our earlier CAT committee meetings, we asked Coastal Health and some of the parties that were there, if a facility were available um, space-wise, how long would it take to staff it? And we were told two years. Um, so, you know, the, the, the need that they're filling, um, there's no question for the need. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, how can we find a way to make it work? Um, and, you know, it's, you, you're targeting the, the, you know, the statistics that came out the other day with um, men in construction being vulnerable, uh, reports we've had at the CAP committee between someone deciding they want help and waiting the 10 weeks or more to get the help is quite often one of the periods in which most, most overdose deaths occur. So, um, you know, I, I just hope we can find a solution that, uh, to make this work because it's um, so desperately needed. And it's something we've all been touched by. Mayor Beamish referred to it. Um, we don't need to get into details, but um, it's something that's touched us all, I think. So um, hopefully um, between staff and you and us, we can come up with a, a, a positive solution. Um, 
No, the, the, the issue obviously comes around currently around zoning and OCP from what I understand and uh, with the email from the director of planning, which you received a copy of. So I'll go to the director of planning to speak to that. Hi everyone, nice to see you again. Um, so yeah, I, I did send them an email on Friday and unfortunately I, I seem to be the bearer of bad news in this situation. Um, it is it is absolutely needed in our community and there is no doubt about that. Um, the location that it's at is designated commercial in our OCP and, in, and it's got a commercial zoning. So unfortunately the use um, is very much residential. Um, it's very much a, in, in accordance with our zoning bylaw, it would be categorized as a residential use for, for people to live in and sleep in and just live. Um, so it would require either a rezoning and an OCP amendment to change that use. Um, alternatively, there could be a temporary, um, we could look at a temporary use um, permit that does have its limitations. It can only be granted for a maximum three-year term, and it can only be renewed once by council. Um, there is a process for that. So uh, you would submit an application and we would prepare staff reports and bring them forward to council. Um, there may be some consultation. We do have to put notices in the newspaper and the property owner would have to apply, of course. Um, and then the, so the, that's one piece is the planning and the, and the zoning. The other piece is the building. So right now the building is classified as a class D occupancy, which is um, business and personal services under the building code. So it would have to get upgraded to a residential building. Um, and without, have, without having done an inspection or sending, without having sent a building inspector in, um, some of the upgrades may include like fire protection, fire separation, uh, seismic and structural upgrades, uh, mechanical ventilation in, and insulation. So there are some pretty, um, some pretty big barriers, uh, but um, opening a facility like this, it, it could be done in any residential neighborhood in, a, in an existing single family dwelling. Um, there is a cost to that, I understand. So that's been the communication we've had. Uh, we don't have a formal temporary use permit application yet, or, or if it's permanent, a rezoning and OCP amendment application. And once we do receive one, we would bring that forward to council for your consideration and decision. Has this uh, building been used as a single family home in the past? Was it built as a single family home? We don't have records of that. So yeah. it's hard to say we did the last building permit they got was not that long ago, like within the past three years. And it was minor upgrades like fire exit lighting mm -hmm. and um, it was designated as a class D occupancy at that time and possibly before. So it's had a, it's had multiple uses in the past, but we don't have the record of um, the single family dwelling. And if it was a single family dwelling at some point, um, hopefully the upgrades wouldn't be as substantial, but when we get a change of use permit, it does have to be upgraded to the current BC building code. So. Go to Councillor Kroll, you, you have a history on that Councillor Kroll? Um, I was just wondering the building, I remember the building at one point being residential, but, and then correct me if I'm wrong, at one point it was the Jack and Jill place yeah, on was, daycare. Yeah. Um, so the building has had a bit of a mixed history. Um, yeah, it, it, it's just Councillor Ladwig has something she'd like yeah. to say. So I'll shut up at this point. Hopefully she's yeah. got some light to shine on this situation. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Councillor Ladwig, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Councillor Kroll. I just don't know if my hand can be seen with this weird background. It, yeah, it disappears, yeah. yeah. So I apologize. Um, Anyways, thank you everyone for your presentation. It is very touching to hear uh, your emotion come through in this. And I, I like Mayor Beamish, I've had personal experience as well. So I understand. Um, I do apologize. I'm feeling a bit in the dark. I must have missed your email on Friday, um, Director of Planning. My family's all been down with the Omicron this week. So we're a little, <laughs> we're a little down and out. Um, if I understand, so I just need to understand 
is the purpose of bringing this to the committee to the committee meeting today just to do a bit of a temperature check with council to see how how we want to proceed before a formal proposal comes forward is that sort of what the objective of today's presentation is about um Dana, you anybody want to add, handle that uh, I, I can go ahead with that um basically yeah we're just we're just trying to open up the lines of communication and we're just looking for a bit of direction um you know because uh First of all, residential, we've tried. We've, we've looked everywhere, countless Hollywell properties, everyone on Craigslist. Um, and secondly, because we are a corporation, we do require a business license. We have multiple support staff. Um, we are kind of run as a business. So we were really hoping that, you know, somehow we could get commercial, a commercial community care, and maybe even uh, one day to add another zoning um category because this isn't going to be the first one that we're doing we're, we're really planning to open up these little recovery pods and um you know the location is perfect i understand about the the legalities but um you know to have 10 10 vehicles of support staff people coming and going in a residential area it just it doesn't work a lot of times and um i mean as many of you know with the stigma of addiction it's really hard to be a good neighbor when you're trying to control all that and you know we've talked to all of our neighbors um, everyone is in full support of what we're doing and you know we've done everything up to crime prevention through environmental design where we've added in security measures lights um, everything so we're just really looking for some direction a temperature reading and you know just to, to see what we can do and all work together because this is a community problem and if we don't all work together it's it's it takes a village so that's kind of where we're at Okay, so that, that's great. That's really helpful. I just wasn't sorry if you don't mind, Councillor DeAndretti. So I just wasn't really sure what the objective of, of today's um, presentation was. But now that I understand that, from my perspective, I mine, I think we should proceed with the temporary use permit or have that come through as a proposal. And I think we should be having conversations with BC Housing and others about what type of grants and assistance we can get these folks to upgrade that building and start thinking about the zoning kind of after like let's at least secure the situation right now and then start looking into options for more long-term planning because i i just i can't believe there isn't some kind of financial assistance that you guys could access i mean i don't know anything about that but i feel like collectively we should be able to <laughs> come up with a plan to to resolve whatever building upgrades are required or that sort of thing. So I, I would vote for the TUP myself at this point is what I'm, at least from what I understand today so far. Councilor Dean Dredd, did I see your hand up at one point? Yes, but TJ, I think he he uh, he wants to talk. Maybe he has a response to Councilor Ladwig I, and I can go after. Sure, thank you so much. I just wanted to say, touch one thing just quickly on the, the funding. Um, because benefit corporations are a for-profit business, um, the, so many of the grants and everything are just unavailable to us. We've, we've tirelessly researched and, and reached out to the community. We have had a few small donations from um, a few of the local businesses. But we've really tried and, and it's it's difficult and discouraging, but we just see the benefit of being a benefit corporation that, you know, it was a risk that we were willing to take. Um, so that's kind of where we stand on that. Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, Councillor Dindra. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I was uh, going to go on the lines that Councillor Ladwig uh, proposed. I, I agree that a temporary use it would speed up and, and actually it would help the community to, to see the process. And, and perhaps when in three years, then the OCP amendment will be like yeah, easy instead of creating resistance because that's what we don't want, right? Any comparison with supportive housing or something. Although I know it has been discussed that the community is supportive, but in the OCP, it's the entire community. Uh, and I think my question is also in terms of uh, the things necessary for occupancy, occupancy, sorry. Are we talking about it's just, uh, it's a timeline or we are talking about also financial <laughs> resources and if there's any way that the, if it's part of financial resource, if the town has some sort of uh, relief in, in a situation like that. I don't know, just considering if there's anything uh, in the town of Gibson's that 
it could be uh, applicable. Um, okay, Councilor Crow, I want to hear from the director of planning relative to the temporary use permit again. So go ahead, Councilor Crow. Um, well, actually, I was going to segue into that, sir. Um, you know, and and you know, to credit staff, they have been looking at at this from both sides now. Um, you know, I had conversation with TJ after the CAT committee meeting. Um, and, you know, I, I think all of us recognize the need and the importance for this facility. That goes without question. And the fact that, you know, you know, saving a life is important. How we do it within the the confines of the system. That's where we, you know, we get caught up in this. And I think, you know, kudos to staff. That, and I think TJ will confirm this with me. We've been back and forth. Staff have been back and forth with them, looking at how best to make, to get the square peg into the round hole. Um, so, um, you know, and a, from a conversation I had with staff last week, the TUP issue came up. I don't know whether it'll work, um, but I think all of us agree that there's the need and we desperately need to make, find a way to make it happen. Um, and also, and I totally appreciate where staff are coming from, um, you know, we, we have to consider safety. You know, we're trying to save people's lives, but we also can't compromise them. So, you know, staff are in an awkward position. Um, you know, it is one of these sort of walking on eggshell situations. But I, I just want to credit staff that they have been proactively working with TJ to try and find a way of making it happen. And um, so I'll, I'll defer to the director of planning at this point. Thank you. Thank you, you director. Um, sorry, so what, what was the question specifically that you'd well, like me to I'd answer? like to go back over again, what steps are required relative to the temporary use permit? Okay, um, so I need a completed application form with a detailed proposal. And then um, we would bring that forward to council for consideration, um, requesting permission to notify, to begin notification. Um, we would notify neighbors, I can't remember, within 50 or 100 meters of the property. And we'd put two ads in the newspaper, um, two consecutive weeks, for two consecutive weeks, um, and send referrals out as well. Once we receive all the referral comments and the public submissions, we bring it back to council for a final decision. Okay. Thank you. And then the, in terms of the building inspection, when does that take place? Well, um, at this point, we've given preliminary comments about what building upgrades are required. So that's something that the applicants will need to consider whether they want to proceed with those upgrades and whether they want to go with the temporary use permit. The TUP basically gives them the zoning permission or the temporary zoning permission. Yeah those building code upgrades are required no matter what. So that's gonna be the second step after the zoning is approved by council or the temporary use permit would yeah. be approved by council. So a building inspection has not been done though, I understand, is that correct? Not since um, the final inspection and TJ might know better than me yeah. um, in the last couple of years. So that being the case, that'd be part of the process, a part of the referral process, the building inspector would look at it and confirm what needs to be done in terms of upgrades? Yeah, I mean, we've given, yeah, we, they could ask for a, an inspection in advance um, yeah. and get that information. But in terms of the, the temporary use permit, that would be solely in council's yeah. um, area for yeah. decision. Yeah. Any building code requirements would be mandatory. DJ, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just, I just want to touch on a few things. The last building inspection was done in 2019 um, when we did all the upgrades for the lights um, and emergency exit signs. The other thing too is I just want to bring up is um, the Community Care and Assisted Living Act. So the facility that we are is kind of in scope of community care and assisted living. So we're kind of a little bit of both categories and it's really unclear because they were written um, quite a while ago and, and we are kind of a new up and coming facility with what we are offering. So I just wanted to say that, you know, as a licensed community care facility, the zoning is totally exempt. So that's something that's kind of 
you know, it's, it's really hard for us to kind of just wrap our head around is, is the differences between we would be offering the same thing, but because we're not licensed and we're just registered, um, it goes from exempt zoning to now having to do all these different upgrades and stuff. So that's just something I want to bring um, to the attention. And, and as far as occupancy, uh, like we're ready to go. So we have clients waiting where we're, our doors are ready. So we could be intaking people next week if that was the case. So um, just to give a timeline of, of kind of where we're at. Thanks. Okay, I appreciate that. Well, I think that I'm sure you appreciate as well that we have a process that we have to go through. And we, and we can't prejudge the outcome of that process. I think you get a sense from council, there's uh, general support for the idea. Uh, the is a required consultation, a referral to the community, and we will hear from, from the area residents as well, and perhaps others as we often do. Uh, we'll certainly be uh, attuned to that as it comes through, and, and you'll hear all that as well, so that uh, when we come forward. So um, I do congratulate you on your initiative, though. I do recognize this is very necessary on the coast, um, we do have an opioid problem. One of those problems that is not being, to me, sufficiently addressed uh, by any agency on the coast. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people are falling through the gaps as a result of that. And as you mentioned, the only way to get this, this kind of in-house treatment, in, 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 inpatient treatment, so to speak, is to leave the coast. And that is not always a successful outcome for, for families either. So. Um, I do encourage you then to go through the process for the director of planning and, uh, and make your application. Uh, we will look forward to seeing that come forward. And um, the, uh, our next council meeting will be in the uh, beginning of February. Uh, so if it does come forward, if you have your application, if the director of planning is ready to bring it forward that time. Otherwise, we meet every second week, the first and third Tuesday of the month. And um, we'll look forward to seeing the application come forward. We can't give you anything outside that process. We can't simply say, hey, the heck with the process, go for it. Uh, that doesn't work, um, and uh, nor, nor, nor should it. We have to follow process. And um, it, uh, it, we'll look forward to seeing the application come forward. And I thank you very much for, for the presentation and for providing more information. I, I did get your email earlier this week with additional information and uh, and support and uh, and i know this is people have tried this in the coast before something somewhat similar um i see one of your letters of support was from ed hill and i recall what he was trying to do several years ago uh, so that uh, it is a challenge i uh, appreciate that so so does council have any further questions or or advice at this time no uh, I'll leave you guys to continue to work with the director of planning and her staff, and uh, um, we will look forward to the next step. So thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Really thank you that. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving forward now with our agenda, uh, I'd like a motion to receive all reports, please. Councilor Kroll, Councilor Dandrad, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, all in favor? Thank you. And your hand does disappear, Councillor Ladwick. <laughs> it's, it's that, it's that uh, screen you got behind you. Close it to you. That's right. Yeah, yeah right in front of your face. Yeah, close it to you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll go to first report then is the change of liquor license at Tapworks Brewing. And the uh, uh, planner, Kirsten Rockins, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so this application relates to, um, sorry, I have to move my view here, uh, to a request for a liquor license change at Tapworks Brewing to allow ongoing use of an outdoor patio. Um, uh, Tapworks is a local brewery most are likely familiar with, with which is located on Cruise Lane behind the Public Art Gallery in Gibson's Landing. Um, tucked below a natural embankment south of Gibson's Way. The brewery has been operation, in operation for close to five years and has service areas including an indoor tap room on the ground floor, a partially enclosed patio on the rooftop level of the building, and an existing outdoor patio, which is permitted as a temporary expanded service area. Um, the request for the outdoor patio is proposed to be, sorry, the requested outdoor patio is located 
um, west of the building adjacent to the parking areas as outlined on this ground level floor plan in blue. And the patio would be open seasonally giving patrons and the establishment a greater choice of seating options and the opportunity for ongoing uh, social distancing. There's no proposed increase to the existing occupancy for the establishment, which allows 52 patrons. So this image shows the existing temporary patio in use. Um, the patio was opened in July of 2020 with permission from the province and the town as a temporary expanded service area or TESA. Um, TESAs were offered by the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch to support businesses and improve distancing through the COVID-19 pandemic. And patio permissions under the program are set to expire in June of this year. And so businesses with TESA patios are invited by the LCRB to apply to make their extended patio areas permanent through a change to their liquor license. Uh, changes to a liquor license are referred to the town by the province for comment and Tapworks proposed permanent patio uh, is intended to be similar to and will replace the existing temporary patio that's shown here in the photo, though it'll be located, it's planned to be located uh, closer to the embankment at the rear of the property, roughly in the location of the shipping containers that are shown and which will be removed. So this slide shows where we are in the application process. Tapworks has applied to the town and the liquor and cannabis licensing branch for the change. Uh, the LCRB referred the application to the town for comment and requires a response within 90 days. Uh, Council's procedure for reviewing liquor license change applications is outlined in Council Policy 1.26 and requires notification of neighbours within 100 metres, as well as a notice in the newspaper for two consecutive week weeks and notices at the at Town Hall via social media and at Tapworks. The first of two staff reports, uh, this report is to share the details of the application with the committee and council and to obtain direction to proceed with notifying residents. Following notification, staff will report back to council with any comments received and will request a council resolution with comments on the liquor license change. Um, staff will then share the resolutions with the province for a decision on the application. So the Liquor Board requests a resolution um, or in the case that applications are delegated, it would be through staff, um, not in Gibson's, <laughs> with comments on the following. Uh, the impact of noise on nearby residents, the impact on the community if approved, the view of residents and how views were gathered, and lastly, any further local government recommendations, including whether or not the application should be approved. Uh, staff has provided an initial review of these considerations on page six and seven of the report and referred the application to the RCMP and fire department for comment and find no, no concerns with the proposal prior to notifying neighbors. In anticipation of questions about parking, I'll clarify that the um, person capacity on the liquor license and building permit for the existing indoor tap room and rooftop patio is 52 persons, and this is not proposed to increase. So therefore there's no impact on required parking for the establishment. Um, and in further clarification, the parking currently provided was supported by the town through a 2016 variance and parking study and includes shared use of adjacent parking areas surrounding the public art gallery and adjacent businesses, as well as use of six public parking spaces that were developed by Tapworks on Gibson's Way. A letter was received with the application from the owner of the adjacent properties supporting the continued shared use of, the, uh, of those lots. Should Tapworks wish to expand its occupancy in, occupancy in the future, a new variance would be required. So staff's recommendations are on page one of the report. The first recommendation is that council direct staff to proceed with the neighbor and public notification as per council policy 1.26. Staff also recommends forwarding the recommendation directly to tonight's council meeting to allow a timely notification. I'm happy to respond to any questions. We also have the applicant Jeff Garnell and co-founders Neil Bergman and Warren Gregory with us to answer any questions the committee might have regarding the proposal. Thank you. Excellent, thank you for your, rec your uh, recommendation. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Kirsten. Um, I am pleased to see that the um, shipping containers are gonna be removed. Uh, I had questions about those, uh, but that's uh, it's good to hear. Um, uh, one question, Kirsten, perhaps you could answer for me. In looking at the uh, page 27 of our agenda, page three of your report, 
um, it shows that the, the the property, the adjacent property, actually encompasses the lane. Um, is that uh, is that correct that we are using private property for our lane? So I think uh, I I don't think I need to look at the view to answer this one. Okay. Part, the the lane itself ends where the property would begin. Beyond that is actually part of its access through the um, Gibson's Art Gallery parking lot. So okay. what is in a practical access to the brewery is actually the parking lot of the gallery. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay, uh, Councillor Councillor Ladwick. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kristen. I, um, I really like the idea personally. I, I think tucking the patio back in is more, uh, it's just a, is a better solution than where it is currently. So I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, one question I had, which is not really even related to this uh, application, but I'm curious about it. I drove by the other day and I noticed a big tree had been cut down right where this new patio is going. And I was wondering, you know, did we, is that part of this process? Is there a tree cutting permit for that? Like you just can't help but notice a huge stump that's been removed. So I was kind of curious what was going on there. Maybe Jeff can answer. <laughs> yeah, we, we got, uh, we got a permit to remove that. There was a bit of a safety hazard. A branch had fallen down uh, nearby to where some patrons were. So it's unrelated to this particular proposal, but uh, just for, for safety, we took it down. Okay, great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that a permit that all that was on the up and up. Anyways, I think it's, I really, I support this move. I think it's good. Thank you. You support enough to make a recommendation, Councilor Ludwig? Sure. I recommend that we, uh, what is the, what is the motion? That we move the motion as written. Yeah. Second to Councilor Carollo, do you have a question? Um, I had a question, Mayor Beamish. Um, 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 well, let, let, let me let me second uh, Council Ladbrook's resolution first, so it's on the table. So I'll second that. Uh, so now recommendation on the table. Now a question. Okay. Um. The que the question I had is the, and again referring to page three of the presentation, which is page twenty seven of the agenda. Um. There's the property that the Tapworks um, facility is located on. And then the adjacent yellow um, outline is not their property, but it's property that's in a lease agreement with the property that fronts onto um, Marine Drive, which is the current site of uh, Zocala and the medical clinic is my understanding. Um, the question I have, what, hap what would happen if we make this change and the, that property changes hands and that lease might be compromised. Jeff, do you want to answer that one or? Yeah, Kirsten, go ahead. Yeah. Through you, Mayor. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah go ahead. Sure, um, so we would we would effectively uh, see operations if we no longer held a lease with the landowner because we wouldn't be entitled to have patrons or staff on, on their property without some kind of agreement. And this um, uh, this patio is on that property. Is that correct? Yes, it currently is, and it will be in future state after it's moved. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kirsten. Yeah, I I can clarify just from a, a planning perspective or the LCBO license perspective that the the service area would be specific to the area outlined on on the plan the site plan so if they weren't able to use that space they would need a new application for any other right. use of any other space right. uh, to me parking is a concern but parking was addressed uh, in 2016 so i'm not going to make that an issue obviously so councillor Kroll. well that I, when it was just follow up to the earlier question with regard to that agreed space because i think that would also impact on the parking would it not Jeff, can you answer? Yeah, so we the um, variance that we received initially and the subsequent rooftop patio application um, is not contingent upon any of those uh, any of that space that we're currently leasing. Um, so we we're actively 
always looking for more solutions for uh, for parking um, to increase our occupancy. But for uh, for for right now, we're we're stuck, so to speak, with with our 50, 52 person occupancy based on the variance and um, creating those those parking spaces. Um, does that answer your question, Councillor Kroll? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Jeff, do you have any sense of how much, uh, what the balance is or ratio is between drive-in patrons and and uh, walk-in? Well, it's it's something we don't actively measure. I mean, it's 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 really it's really hard to tell. I mean, yeah. we we have um, we have great relationships with all of our neighbors. So I yeah. don't know if you've been to the brewery lately, but you'll notice that um, a number of a number of signs showing support for uh, for parking spaces being used for tap works during designated hours, with, which happen to be our peak hours. Um, the Gibson Public Art Gallery has agreed to do um, four spaces. Um, I shouldn't say has agreed to, have, have expressed interest in, in doing four spaces that would be dedicated for tap works when, when they're closed. So that's, that's kind of how we've approached it so mm -hmm. far is just taking as proactive uh, an approach as possible to, to uh, you know, ensuring that we're, we're good neighbors when it comes to, comes to our patrons parking and we're, we're good about, you know, reminding everyone, although that's not with its, uh, with its hiccups every now and then, but I think, I think that's the case for parking in general in Lower Gibsons is it can be an absolute zoo, especially yeah. during. Yeah. Um, so. Councillor Dean Dredd. Thank you. Yeah, I support the project. I think uh, it's, it is a, a, a good, uh, business for the community and good opportunity to uh, enhance tourism. I'm just curious with the the tree, has uh, another tree being planted on the site or is there a plan to do that? It's, it's not our property. So we our, our main concern was safety. So we we applied for, for having that, that tree taken down. That is a fairly overgrown area and has lots of trees in it right now. But that's uh, that's something we'd look into for sure. Okay, thank you, Councilor Kroll. Um, just a a comment. Um, should this all be approved and go ahead, one of the things I would recommend um, is that if you get the patio, is incorporating somewhere in that area a bike rack. Um, on several occasions when I visited the premise, there's bicycles leaning against this, that, and the other thing, and people always seem to be looking for a place to properly secure a bike. So having a proper bike rack that people could utilize, I think might, um, might eliminate a bit of the parking problem. And, yeah. Uh, we do have two, we do have two up front of the brewery. I'd, I'd be interested in having more too. Yeah, thank you. Hey, council has been recommended and seconded to uh, call the question. Uh, and this is the recommended to be, and uh, directed to initiate community notification process as outlined in Council Policy 126. All in favor? None opposed, so thank you very much. So on to the next step, uh, Jeff and Kirsten. Let's uh, move it forward. Kirsten, you have anything to say? I will just mention a, a recommendation to move this directly to tonight's council would be appreciated as well. Yeah, if that's that okay. Part of the recommendations, yes, that's right. Perfect. Recommendation to move to council tonight's council meeting. Uh, Councillor Deandre, Councillor Kroll, all in favor? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation and good thank luck. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll now go to the director of planning. And, uh, we have a fourth quarter report and um, I'm going to somewhat draw attention to the time because we have a fairly lengthy in camera session so I'm going to ask director of planning to give a high level report and ask if any council members have any questions for the report after she does that so director of planning thank you mayor um, I can keep this short um, I just want to note that Silas White is um, in the attendees list okay. and same with Sue Booth. So Sorry, I've been trying thing. to move them. They're just not moving. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. And, and, Sue, and Sue Booth as well, um, just if there are any questions. Um, okay, so high level, I, I, I'll just, I'll keep this really high level then. Um, 
in terms of I guess for staffing the main the main staffing challenge we're dealing with right now is um, restocking our building department <laughs> um, mm. so in May we lost one building official and then again we lost um, our admin assistant so Lori left us in November and she was the brains behind a lot of our records and administration. And then we lost uh, John Hart, our other building official in December. So there, those are the three um, vacant positions we are recruiting for right now. We do have three um, building officials, three level three casual building officials that are actually SCRD building officials. And um, they're uh, stepping in to help support uh, the building department while we recruit to fill the yep. vacancies. Um, in terms of affordable housing projects, um, the latest update can be the uh, housing strategy. So um, in October, um, we had a council workshop with Urban Matters, and um, I've received a report from um, Urban Matters, which I need to review and then bring back to council. But at the high level, the following themes emerged from the council workshop as priorities for this council. One is to establish a regional housing service to directly fund affordable housing on the Sunshine Coast, and this would um, involve working with other levels of government on the Sunshine Coast. The other is to increase workforce rental and, and attainable home ownership. And that would involve exploring tools used to strengthen the delivery of workforce rental and attainable home ownership. The third is to develop a land strategy and this would identify sites suitable for a range of rental housing across the continuum. And it could identify and map suitable sites for affordable housing projects and include criteria for municipal contributions towards affordable housing projects um, and partnerships. And then the fourth is to advocate to senior levels of government um, for funding for um, um, partnerships and, and so forth. So those are the four themes that came out of that workshop and there's more to come. I'll bring a, a complete report with an updated housing strategy to council um, this quarter. Um, everybody needs a home. That is Silas's section of the report. He generously prepared that. Um, Silas, do you want to prepare a quick or uh, share a quick update with Council on that section? Uh, hi, I'm out doing it. Hey, Silas. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I it's it's I don't have anything to add. Um, I yeah I. Um, completed that very recently. So uh, there's there's not a lot to add over the last couple of days um, from that report. It's Sarah's written and um, I'm here for any questions. Okay, thank you, Silas. I yeah. understand your, your timing. So I'm not yeah, gonna, I'm not gonna read it yeah. to you. Yeah. yeah, I think we've been kept abreast of what you've been doing uh, uh, recent uh, over Christmas. So I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, Okay, I'll, I'll continue then and, and we can take questions at the end. Um, so for short term rentals, um, I did receive a statement of intent um, just this week or last week from uh, third space planning, which outlines um, council's goals and outlines a, a program. So I just need to review that and ho I'm hoping we can bring that forward um, shortly as well. Um, other highlights, uh, we've got the Healthy Harbor project on here. Um, they will be coming for uh, as a delegation in February, so I don't need to say much about that other than I'm gonna flag that they are currently selecting voluntary no anchor zone marker buoys to demarcate eelgrass conservation areas. Um, and that's gonna go around Armour's Beach and the breakwater area. So they're planning to install these in late uh, Q1 2022. Um, d development permit areas for um, DPA number one and two, so geotechnical and environmental urban systems has prepared um, an RFP for us. I'm just reviewing it and I'm working towards bringing that back to council shortly. Um, the resolution that you passed was to bring it before uh, February 15th. So I'm aiming for the next council meeting, um, hopefully 
we can move forward on that. Um, for the DPA 9 update, um, this has been jointly in planning and infrastructures um, area. Um, the update is intended to expand measures to protect all groundwater surfaces, um, or sources, sorry, and that includes both Capilano and the Gibsons Aquifer, and to improve clarity for applicants and professionals reviewing development proposals. What we've come to at this point is bringing a lot of the requirement or the, the guidelines that are under the development permit area into bylaws. So we have, um, we have existing bylaws, we have 1175 and 1192, and we have a means to bring a lot of the requirements into those bylaws. What that would do is reduce the area for development permit areas and just make it mandatory for a lot of these processes. So um, right now we're just waiting on the aquifer mapping study to get updated completely and then we're going to bring the whole package forward together. Good. So that's the latest update there. Um, in terms of development applications, we reached another record year. <laughs> um, so we're on par with 2018 with development applications um, with a total of 68 um, in 2021. Um, I'm not going to go through the development applications, but if you have any questions, I can, I can answer questions. Um, in terms of the uh, building department stats, I'm just going to flag, um, because we lost our staff, we were um, trying to find the numbers and trying to trying to bring those stats forward, but they might need, they might not be 100% accurate so, and subject to review, but we did our best to try and share the numbers. Um, basically, at a high level, we're, um, we're, process we're still processing a lot of applications and it's not slowing down. And just looking at the number of um, planning applications that we're processing, it's trickling into building as well. So mm -hmm. first step is to come through planning and then it goes to building. So they're um, steadily busy. And now with Parkland, um, the Parkland subdivision being approved, a lot of those buildings are getting built out now. We're getting a lot of um, development applications up there or building permit applications. We also launched cloud permit, um, and as of this year, all building permit applications are virtual. So that's a new move for us as well. Um, and then in terms of bylaw enforcement, um, Sue has been extremely busy um, this year and since the start of the pandemic. Um, in just quarter four, she, she responded to 101 complaint files um, and seven new business license applications came in. So people are still um, applying for new businesses. Um, a total of 495 files were processed this year compared to 559 files in 2020. And prior to that, the 10 year average was 237 complaint files. So um, she's up 81% in just complaints. And so She's been working amazingly hard and is not slowing down. Um, but the the implications of that are less capacity and other aspects of her role. And that includes um, parking patrols have just stopped um, and foot patrols as well. So um, she's been busy. Um, and I will leave it at that for now. Um, if you have any Thank questions. Okay. Councilor Dean Dredd, you're first. Thank you, Mayor. I have just uh, two very quick questions. One regards, it's the very last project on page nine of your report and is an application for development of a beach access trail. I just would like to know if this trail will have public access. And my second question is uh, on Sue's report, if it's possible that, you know, every quarter you present the three months separately, if it's possible on the very last, just on the year to date, just to provide the breakdowns of the orders, because the breakdown is basically 40%. To me, as, as a counselor, it's really important to understand what complaints are, you know, what are, are, are the complaints and being 40%, there's 40% that I don't know. I'm not aware. I would like to be aware. And so that's uh, my two questions. 
Okay, so for the first question, Franklin Road, that is a private um, access. It's on private property, and they're just they're putting in an access down to the beach on their property. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and um, in terms of the forty percent, I'm not exactly following you there. Um, what? Where the other. It's the other category. Other. The other. Yeah. Okay. It's usually around it's 42, 38, depending on the month, at least since I started looking at. And last time she did provide a breakdown, which to mm -hmm. me was, was very useful, right? I mean, things that I didn't even consider. So what I thought is instead of every time that she present the quarterly report, instead of she has to do for all the three months, she can always do just for the year today, right? So we have a sense of what the complaints is about. Okay, we can try our best with that. I mean, we 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 do get a wide range of complaints. Um, okay. But Sue, Sue, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yes, I do. I did send out an email in November uh, with the year to date with a little breakdown, and you'll see a lot of them are for illegal dumping, burning, mm -hmm. uh, tree related, and especially wildlife calls. Mm -hmm. So we have added another section on the monthly report now, which will. Uh, show the wildlife calls, which will uh, account for a lot of that uh, 40%. Uh, but we'll, we'll try and get those numbers out there um, for okay. sure. And I'm, I'm breaking down the wildlife calls to different, I know different you're animals. Busy. <laughs> Sorry, but it's so That's important okay. to understand. I, I, I didn't have the awareness, so thank you so much. No problem. Other questions, Council? Councilor Kroll? Thank you, Mayor Beamish. Um, and, and this would be just with respect to the new business licenses, if there could be, is there any indication of what type of businesses they are? Yeah, there, there, there is an indication in the report. So um, the new business licenses included cafes, contracting, consulting, tourism, and yoga. They're the categories. Thank you. One thing about business license, because I actually uh, sign a letter to all the new applicants. It's interesting to me to see how many of those applicants are outside of the community and just taking a license because they they offer a service within the community as well. Sort of thing. So it's a more of a regional service. So it's interesting. That, that was sort of the where yeah, I yeah. was coming from. Yeah. Other questions? I see Silas is with us. Any questions for Silas? Silas, is the um, is the drop-in open now? Or are you managing to stay closed for a while? Um, closed for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Catching up on some other things right now. The drop-in, the um, the attendance dwindled uh, to you know, as the weather got better. Understandably, yeah. the attendance dwindled to. Uh, two or three people. Um, sometimes, sometimes it was one, a couple of days. So, so that's good news that uh, people aren't aren't in need of it so much right now. Yeah. But uh, yeah. we're definitely standing by to open it uh, yeah. as soon as, as soon as the extreme weather kicks in again, which uh, yeah. will no doubt uh, happen again this winter. Yeah. Thank you. See no other questions, uh, Director. I thank you very much uh, to you and. Uh, Sue and Silas and all of your staff uh, for the great job that you do. It's a, it's a, it's one of those things a lot behind the scenes that uh, people don't see. Um, it's not like water and sewer, uh, but it's uh, extremely important and we really, really appreciate all that you do. And I sent you an email about another project. Potential. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very uh, much. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, well, we still have ourselves all here. Uh, we'll go to the agenda. We're going to uh, be a journey to go to in camera shortly, but um, uh, we'll go for inquiries first. So, uh, any inquiries that uh, uh, Rebecca? Uh, yes, I see someone. Uh, I am moving over Judith Bunkoff. Okay, thank you. I've been having a little trouble moving people over. So, oh, there she goes. There Good. she is, yeah. Hi, Mayor Welcome. and Council. Welcome, Judith. Yeah. Hi. Um, just um, want to touch on this, um, the tap works and the proposal for um, a liquor license, if I can. Um, my question would be, um, how many parking spots 
does the um, tap books have right now that they actually have? And I guess the second part of that question is, have they got the required amounts that the bylaw um, the, the bylaw stipulates that there are so many parking spots per, per, per person standing or whatever at a bar? I studied it once and um, I'm trying to remember, but I'm thinking it's one spot per two people. Um, I could be wrong on that. And I know they got a variance. So I understand yeah. they've got a variance. Um, that being said, I'd like to know the requirement and wonder why we don't hold true to our bylaws when we, when it's, when we need parking spaces so badly. So I'm asking, I guess, how many they were, they were um, allowed. I mean, how many they, they have actual parking spots other than using GPAGs and using Zocalos and everybody else's. How many do they have of their own? My understanding is they on site have very few, uh, but the uh, they did get a variance as I mentioned, as, as you mentioned, acknowledged for for parking back in 2016, uh, and that still stands. So that they uh, and the arrangements they have with others, the the application that they're making today, um, I understand, does not increase seating uh, or capacity. So that. Uh, it doesn't uh, extend uh, beyond the original application and then the variances approved in 2016. The exact numbers, I would have to get back to you on that uh, in terms of the, the bylaw and where they stand. Okay, I'm just making a point only because parking is such a bugger down there. Yeah. And I just feel, you know, it sets a precedent that I don't like and that it continues and yeah. continues. And that's my point. The other thing that's very curious um, for me was to see this afternoon, um, you know, the, the pitch for the treatment facilities when I find it really hard to get treatment facilities, but really easy to get drinking facilities. Just a point. All right, okay. so that's all, thank you. Thank you. Other inquiries? No other inquiries. Okay. Seeing none, we're going to uh, then uh, like a motion to close the meeting and close in accordance with section 91C, discussion about town corporate structure of the community charter and uh, C, labor relations, uh, uh, other employee relations. Motion, Councilor Kroll, thank you. Councilor Ladwig, thank you. All in favor of closing? Thank you. Okay, and thank you very much to the members of the public who attended and to staff who attended. Appreciate your time and uh, uh, we'll 